Ah, yes. Okay, good evening, everyone. Let me look at the sound levels. Hopefully it's clear. How are you? Last week of objective papers and you are done with your AS. Look at you, you've come so far, right? Okay, I'll jump to answer some questions. I think by this point in time is tradition. Let me know how you're doing in the chat. You okay? Um, I finally Cambridge has released the Fat March two three papers, so I will do some now because I can find it from the Cambridge website, which means it's uh it's finally been published and teachers can discuss it right now. Okay, so um. If you have a link, you can share it with your friends. Uh, I believe most websites can download by now, but I'm not too sure about that. Anyway, hello, Unas. Okay, I'll, I'll do some questions. I'm going to start with the community post. So if you check the description for this channel, there's a community post. Just put your questions there. It's easier for me to see. You can also upvote similar questions. I'll run the live stream until about 11, and then we will wish each other good night and all the best okay so let me, let me crop this a little bit Just one sec I need to go and find the, hang on. That much two, three papers for you. But well, in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the community chat. But in the live stream chat, uh, sometimes the chat moves really fast, so I can't see anything. But it's fine. That one is for you to talk to each other. Okay, let me see. Do we also have an accent port? We don't. Okay. So I'm going to start by working on a question. from the community post. This is a standing wave question. So let me crop it first. Um, I'll try to focus on doing the more recent questions because we want to be able to cover the actual question type because the older questions are not as uh, recent, so the, the way of asking questions are different, okay? And I think uh, the key to under answering objective questions is to be able to identify when a question will take up a lot of time and when a question can be answered immediately. Of course, for different students, it's different. Uh. Maybe you have certain topics that you're good at. Maybe there are certain topics that you are not good at. So ideally, you want to spend for paper one around one minute per question. Of course, uh, it may be very hard for you to think about, am I spending one minute per question, right? So generally, my recommendation is for you to gauge whether you have that time based on the page number. So for example, if I open this winter 2-2 paper, for example, if you look at this one, <clears throat> okay. So let's say if I'm doing this paper, right, and I start with page one. So on first glance, page one has four questions. So I should spend about five minutes here, four to five minutes. This one has two questions, maybe another two to three minutes. So ideally, by the time you reach question 10, you put your head up and look at the clock, maybe about 15 minutes should pass. Okay? Then you continue on with your life, and then maybe when you finish all the uh, elasticity questions somewhere here, your question 20, and you look at the clock, oh, maybe another 40 minutes has passed. It's still okay, good pace, but cannot slow down. So then 
you work on waves, more waves. Then suddenly you start to see some circuit question. You have 10 more questions to go. You should have about 20, 15 to 20 minutes left. Okay, so if they say, for example, by the time you reach here, you have only 10 minutes, you know you are running out of time. Circuit question can be a bit challenging. Go to the back and do the easy one first. Like, you know, this I find this very easy lah, because it's just fundamental particles and quarks and alpha particles. So it's like chapters that you can study. So you want to quickly get this question out of the way. Now maybe you have eight minutes. So this one looks very complicated. This one looks very complicated. I'm not going to do that. Maybe I'll do this because this one is asking for the EM, the ratio of EMF. This one seems doable, no calculation needed. This one looks like there is a ratio, maybe I'll skip this, maybe I'll do this one first. So you gotta strategize a bit and be very aware of your time. But ideally, you should spend around one minute per question, including shading. A lot of times students will leave the very last minute to shade the answer on the OMR paper. Please don't do that. Okay, maybe every five questions you should shade or you should shade each question. Okay, because no extra time will be given and no extra time should be given. So try to spend around one minute per question. Is it very fast? Yes, but that's the nature of objective. It's about quick decision making. It's not really about showing your working. Is how quickly can you find the solution to the question. Sometimes you can answer it better by elimination. Okay, so it's about quick decision, make, decision making and it's training a different skill set in sciences. So in science, sometimes it's important to show, uh, show us the working. That would be paper two. Show the working. How do you arrive at the answer? But for paper one, it's about split, split decision making, split second decision making. Sometimes the decision making could include this question feels like it needs a lot of my time. I'm going to skip it and come back to it if I have time. If not, I'll just shade any random alphabet. Okay, uh, so we are training this. If you're not used to this, then do what you can. Uh, try not to linger too long in a question. Okay, so I've talked enough. I will I'll do this question now. Let me adjust this one first. So for standing wave questions, sometimes they give you a diagram, which is great. Sometimes they don't. The important thing about standing wave is to be able to develop certain skills for yourself so that when you see a question like this, you know how to interface with it, which is number one, make sure that you can draw or sketch the waveform. So different question is different. Um, it's ideal that you can memorize a few types of waveform, like the open column, open-ended column, closed-end column, okay? But sometimes we don't really know uh, what is going on, so we're just going to read the question, right? So we have two waves of equal frequency and amplitude traveling in opposite direction. So I already know that this is the condition for standing wave. When I see this equal wave, opposite direction, my brain immediately goes to standing wave. I am not thinking about progressive wave, my brain is thinking about standing wave. So I know what waveform to sketch. Okay, and then it says here when they meet, they form a stationary wave. Look at the question being so helpful to you. And it says it has three nodes and two empty nodes. I guess I'm going to sketch my waveform now. So for stretch string, right, most of the time we will tie the string between two places, right? So this is my string, okay, and normally on one side we will attach this side to a vibrator. So this is a vibrator. Then maybe this side here will attach it to a wall. So you should know the basic setup. Okay. So right now, wherever I'm tying the string to the vibrator, obviously it will be a note. Because it's tied to the vibrator. Okay. And then at the wall, it will also be a note. So it says here that there are three notes and two empty notes. So right in the middle, there will be another note. Three notes, no? Where are the two other empty notes? One empty note is here, one empty note is here. And now, if you sort of know the positions of notes and empty notes, you can sketch the waveform. It will look something like this. Right? Sketch the waveform. So right now, I'm going to do some equation. Okay, after sketching the waveform, number two, what I'll do is I will write an equation between the length of the column 
or the length of the string. So I want to relate lengths, either length of the string or length of the air column, and the wavelength. So for example, right now, the length of this string, here, 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 let's say this one is L, I don't know, it's just L, it's L, it's not going to change, it's the same string, so L, okay, and L also looks like, just based on the waveform, lambda, okay, so you need to be able to start like that first, be able to sketch out a graph, be able to set up the question. Once you set up the question, now you look at what the question wants from you. The frequency of both waves is now doubled and the new station, the real wave is formed. So when I see that the frequency is doubled, what happens to the wavelength? Lambda le? Because number three, you are going to use the equation V equal to F lambda to try to come to a solution. So right now, if I look at V equal to F lambda, V is constant. The speed of the string wave is constant because it's the same string. So if velocity is constant, then when frequency is doubled, wavelength is half. All right. So it's a bit like, let's say this is my lambda one. So this is my first waveform. I'm going to call this lambda one. So this whole length is also equal to lambda 1. Here to here is lambda 1. Okay, so this will be lambda 1. This is F1. And then now if I double the frequency, V is equal to 2F2. This is my second wave, the double frequency, 2F1, sorry. Double the frequency, right? So how should I make sure that the value of v is still the same. I will need to take this new lambda, divide by 2. That way when I cut them off, it will still be the same thing. Lah. So this will be lambda 1 divided by 2. Hence, you see the term lambda is halved. Okay. So how much work do you need to do to be able to do this in your brain? I don't know. Only you can answer that. But the whole idea here is when you multiply two numbers and you always get the same value, if one number is half, the other one must double. If not, how will you get back the same number? All right. So I know the wavelength is half. So what do I do now? They are asking me how many anti nodes are there. So basically now, go back and redraw a new wave. Okay. So these are the tools you have. You can sketch, you can write L in terms of lambda if needed, and then you can just draw. So I'm going to draw again, but right now my wavelength is halved. So to half my wavelength, I'm going to draw it directly underneath here so you can compare. This is my vibrator, and this is my wall. Half my wavelength implies that I can fit more waves within the boundary. Okay, so as usual, I'm going to start with a node here. I'll start with a node here. Okay, so let's imagine my string is here. Okay, something like this. So I'm going to start with a note here and a note here. And now I have to squeeze another wavelength inside. So I'm going to start chopping my waves into halves. This is the original lambda. I'm going to add another one here and add another one here. So now let me try to draw again. Is the drawing necessary? Not if you can visualize, but let's say, you know, let's pretend that it's needed. So right now, if I look at this shape, I can see that I have already half the wavelength. How do I know? Because now one wavelength, which is here to here, is exactly half of lambda one. So this lambda two is actually lambda one divided by two. Basically, I cut the wave into half. So right now, how many anti nodes do I have? One, two, three, four. I will have four anti nodes. Okay. So students who answer this question a little bit quicker would be able to sketch the waveform and think to themselves, well, from this shape, right, I want to be able to fit because I know the wavelength is half. So immediately they can tell that wavelength is half. So first they draw like that, and they think to themselves, hmm, I want to fit 
double the amount of wave so they will immediately start to draw like that already because they know that the wavelength is cut by half so from this original wavelength if it helps I will delete this one this is half so the wavelength is already halved so if the wavelength is half means I can fit two waves if I can fit two wave means I can fit two more anti nodes and then they will choose four so I'll write this down here, the thought process. If the wavelength is half, I can fit another complete cycle. And another complete cycle means plus two anti note. So two plus two is four. Okay? Or when you are practicing, you will need to draw them out until you are confident then you are able to actually do this slightly shorter thought process and choose the right answer. Okay, so that's it for this question. And stationary waves are like that. They will take out a lot of time if you lack of practice. So if let's say you haven't been practicing, that's okay. It's only one or two questions. Skip it. Come back to it later. You can slowly take your time to draw. Okay, so we're going to continue. Let me... Look at the community posts, starting from the latest one or the oldest one. I want to look at summer 15P11 question 3. Question It is this question, I believe. Okay. So this question has been plaguing students for years because it's a unit conversion question but they ask it in a very strange way so it can be a bit unusual but let us read the question it says here that when a constant braking force is applied on a vehicle moving at speed v the distance d moved by the vehicle coming to rest is given by this equation okay where k is constant okay so i'm given the equation not sure where the equation comes from it doesn't really matter it says here that d is measured when d is measured in meters and v is measured in meter per second the constant has a value of k1 so i'm going to write that down as a note here let me all write it here when d is equal to k1 v square this unit is in meter this unit is in meter per second okay what is the value of the constant so there's a new constant now so what's that value of this new constant when the distance is measured in meters but i change the speed the speed is now measured in kilometers per hour so let me rewrite my equation again now d is let's say this is the second constant i'm going to call this k2 okay so d is equal to k2 v square so this is m however this is kept in kilometer per hour okay so right now i gotta make sure that i know how to convert between okay i'm gonna divide and conquer i want to know how to convert between meter per second and kilometer per hour because this is a different unit right so let me divide and conquer first and try to figure out 
what is the unit conversion between meter per second and kilometer per hour okay so let's say for example I look at one kilometer per hour okay this is the same as one let's say I want meter per second so I'm going to multiply this one by km 1 km but because I cannot change the value so the, the unit that I don't want I'll write underneath here but the unit that I want which is meter I will write up here but 1 km does not make 1 meter so hopefully you know 1 km is 1000 meter or 1 times 10 to the power of 3 okay so that this entire bracket is 1 okay and then later on there's a per hour here I don't want hour so I put the hour on top here and I think to myself why is one hour in terms of seconds well that would be three six zero zero seconds and again in this bracket the value here is one so I didn't change the value okay so right now what I'll do is I'll cancel the units that I don't want remaining the units that I want which is 1000 1, meter over 3600 second making this 1 over 3.6 meter per second 1 kilometer per hour okay this tells me that the conversion factor is 3.6 meaning if I want to convert kilometer per hour to meter per second I would divide by 3.6 if I want to convert meter per hour or rather the other direction meter per second to kilometer per hour the conversion factor is 3.6 let me see 1 meter per second is 3.6 kilometer per hour so this will be multiply this will be divide okay so conversion vector is 3.6 some people uh, know this already they already know it's 3.6 maybe through practice or exercise or they memorize then they don't have to do this all they save themselves a minute or two okay so right now immediately I need to think strategic I have a square here see a square so this tells me that 3.6 is out because I need to square this 3.6 so 3.6 k1 is out and also if I read if I take out my calculator and check in on 1 over 3.6 this is also out 0 0.27278 out thanks to the square so I'll bet you that 13 is 3.6 square and 0 0.072 is 1 over 3.6 square so these are our two contenders does that make sense? So if let's say for example if I'm doing objective very quickly when I see 3.6 right I already know the conversion factor is 3.6 these two is automatically eliminated I have a 50% chance of getting the right answer okay all right so the second thing here is try to figure out whether you need to multiply or divide by 3.6 okay so right now if I want to let's say do, make it easy for myself and not think too much I see that I have two equations here equation 1 and equation 2 correct okay so you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna divide my equations but I will factor in the units so okay so right now my equation 1 is D is equal to K1 B square the problem here is V so I'm gonna like be very mindful about what this V is and then divided by D over K2 V square this is a different unit okay so the unit or rather I'll mention here taking units right so the units for D and D is M over M there's no problem with the value or the units for D okay and now what you are left here is K1 over K2 this one also is okay I'm happy that they are here because I actually need to find K2 in terms of K1 but what is the unit for V square V square here is meter per second and kilometer per hour is down here oh, sorry kilometer per hour yes square so I can't cancel off the unit without making them the same so it really depends on you know meter per meter is cancel 
K1 over K2. Depends on what I want to substitute in, right? So let's say I go the easy route here. One kilometer per hour is uh, one over 3.6 meter per second. You can see this factor here, right? Or if I don't want to deal with fraction, I can say 3.6 kilometer per hour is one meter per second. So this will be 3.6 kilometer per hour over one kilometer per hour square. So the kilometer per hour and the kilometer per hour finally cancels off and your life is now good. Okay, so what you have now is K1 over K2. I'll bring this one over. is 1 over 3.6 square. So finally, you will have K2 is equal to 1 over 3.6. Hang on. Let me delete this. Yeah, let me check and make sure that I have done the right things. Speed in kilometer per hour is 3.6. Okay, so from here I will have K2 is equal to 1 over 3.6 square K1 or K1 over 3.6 square and this would be equal to 0. Answer is A. La. Hey, hey, let me square this. 0 0.0716. You okay? So the answer is A. So this is a kind of a difficult question, but even if you don't know what to do or you couldn't think of dividing the equations, don't worry about it because you can always think of the fact that the conversion factor is 3.6 and eliminate B and C. Okay, and find out that at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find K, K2 in terms of K1. So you can do equations, you can do elimination, or you can even just directly substitute this one in here. Okay, so that is this one. Let me check out. Yeah, this question is a headache. It's only one question. I tell you what, Cambridge doesn't uh, check the doesn't check out too much on the questions. They will keep the same questions. So if you see it again, you already know the answer. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the community post and see what are the remaining questions. If you have a question to follow up here, you can go to the community post and just ask underneath. Community post is here. Go to the channel, click on the community tab, uh, ask here. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Next one looks like a circuit question. So O N nineteen P one one question to each. Question thirty three. Okay, this question is a graph question. 
is asking us how the resistance of a filament lamp varies with applied potential difference. So the first thing to identify is filament lamp gets hot. Okay, um, I have a short way to answer this. Generally, when it gets hot, there is more lattice vibration. This is metal, right? It's a metal or it's a conductor. So when it gets hot, the atoms will vibrate more. And because there is more lattice vibration, there is greater resistance. Difficult for the electron to move through the atoms if the atoms are all vibrating. Means when V increase, R increase. So C and D is up. Now I'm left with A and B. So normally objective questions are like that one. You can fairly quickly eliminate two, two answers and then now you are left with one. I mean 50-50% chance. Okay, then what do we do? Increase to the normal operating potential difference. So now I got to figure out whether it's linear or curve. But I think it's easier to figure out whether when V is 0, is the resistance 0, or when V is 0, the resistance is not 0. You can either figure out using this coordinate, basically when V is 0, what is R? Or you can figure out an equation to inform you how the curve would look like. What would be the shape of the curve? Okay. So, right, next. Let's see. Maybe we need an equation. Or we need an IV characteristic curve for the filament lamp. So if let's say I look at the IV characteristic curve of a filament lamp, I kind of sort of expect a graph to look like this. So the resistance actually decreases because remember resistance is the ratio of V over I, right? So right now, I think about the ratio of V over I. Mm. The ratio of V over I here is very weird because here when V is equal to 0, I is equal to 0, R is equal to what? 0. Ah. No, if you do maths, you know you can't divide by 0. So from here, I cannot conclude because I don't know what is 0 over 0. You go and ask a maths teacher, they also undefined, cannot define. Okay, but definitely not zero. So I feel that the answer could be A. Okay, and also at the same time, when V is equal to zero, does it mean that the filament has no, no resistance? Cannot be right. Okay, so basically, um, when V equal to zero, R cannot be zero. That would be a one way to, for you to choose A fairly quickly. But let's say, for example, you still want an equation because it looks linear. So you want an equation that feels right to you when it comes to the linearity. It's a little bit pretty difficult because you are dealing with a curve here. Right? So if you are dealing with a curve, there's pretty much nothing much that you can do to try to come up with the gradient of this curve because the behavior of every single uh, every single question is or rather every single filament lamp depending on the type of material that they use is different okay so I think the the answer here is a and mainly this is referring to this one so the filament lamp will always have resistance because it's a type of material a type of metal right Okay, filament has resistance when PD is small. Not exactly zero, doesn't really matter, it has to be small. Okay, if you choose B, not because you check the axis, but because you memorize the shape, then cannot lah. So B is already very sus one, because it looks like the IV characteristic graph of this one. This one is IV curve, question mark. Okay, so that will be this question. Okay. 
Moving on. Difference between diffraction pattern of double slit and diffraction grating. Have you? The one you can Google. But I'll teach you how to Google, I guess. Diffraction grating versus double slit. I'm going to click on images because I like to stare at pictures. There you go. So you can see from one slit, as you increase the number of slit, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So by the time you have many, many slits, this one will close into a bright dot. Okay. So I guess this is a nicer picture. Oh, this is even nice. Light. You got one slit, it spreads out. This is a double slit. So double slit, you see bright dark, bright dark, bright dark fringes, but the separation between them is fairly uniform. Okay, you see when it comes to seven slit, the bright bands become narrower and narrower. So if let's say now you have n slits, can we make this bigger? Let me see. If let's say you have n slits, this is a double slit. Your bright fringe is fat. This is a diffraction grating. Your bright fringe is very narrow. Okay, well, this is the answer. Double slit, diffraction grating. They have a different equation for your syllabus, although d sine theta equal to n lambda is actually the same equation as lambda is ax over d. But for your syllabus, you don't want to know the relationship of that, those two equations. They are related, very closely related, but it's not within the scope of a syllabus. So don't worry about it because currently we are studying for exam, exam tomorrow. Okay. So what you need to know about pattern is number one, double slit, the gap. These bright bands are very white. Number Diffraction grating is very small. Number two, diffraction grating uses this equation, d sine theta is n lambda. Double slit. Although it uses this equation, we don't use it at all. We use lambda is ax over d. Okay. So I think I will borrow random lecturer A's slide that I found on Google. Okay. And then for A level syllabus. Cambridge. Ah, other 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 board I don't know ah. Cambridge, the one you use this, the one you this one. Lambda is AX over D. So here normally we'll have a double slit. Right? So my double slit is let me draw the slit better for you. So now you see there are two slits, right? Double slits. So the slit separation between here and here is your A. Okay, X is between bright fringe and bright fringe or dark fringe or dark fringe. This can be X, maximum to maximum. It can also be minimum to minimum. Okay, doesn't discriminate because the pattern is uniform, approximately uniform. Okay, and then D is the separation between the double slit and the screen. Let's say there's a screen here. D. So the equation that we're going to use is not D sine theta is n lambda, but lambda is equal to AX over D. Okay, so you can use the, the lambda, I mean the double slit to find the value of lambda. But a more accurate one, this one you can see the maxima is narrower. So for this one, we instead of a double slit, you see, one, two, double slit, we will replace the double slit with a grating. What a grating is, is something with many, 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 many holes. Okay, so this is a two slit, this is a grating. Okay, so for grating, we use this equation d sine theta is m lambda or n lambda. We don't really care about the 0 0.5. Destructive cannot see. Ma. So all we care about is the integer numbers. 1, 2, 3. Okay? And the value of theta is 
where we measure from the center of the grating, from the center order, let's say to n equal to 2. So this one is the theta 2. Okay, lah. that's the difference. Don't know what else to tell you, but we will continue. Um, winter 22. Okay, let me type out the question. ON22 P13 Question 10. I'll do this now. Roughly check on chat. Maybe I should look at chat now. How are we? Okay, no one is. Yay! Okay, la, talk to each other. Ask questions in the community post. Turn twenty two P one three. Question ten. Uh, this one I quite like this question. Is testing whether students understand physics or not? Or they just memorize? Which is also okay, it's not really a problem. It's just a conceptual question difficult. Look. So in this question, this conceptual question, they give you a scenario and you really need to read it properly and think about the conservation of momentum without actually being able to calculate anything much. So let's read the question first. It says that both blocks are at rest on the frictionless surface. So I have the wooden block and the steel block. One block is made out of wood and the other one is made out of steel. Okay. A steel ball is fired horizontally with a speed V at the wooden block. So this is the first steel ball. I shoot it, it hit the wooden block, and the ball embeds itself into the block. So this means right after this bullet or this steel ball hits the, the wood, it's, it's stuck inside the wood and they move together. The block moves together after impact. I am going to call this V1. Make sense, right? The bullet or the ball hits the wood, they move together. Okay. The second identical steel ball is fired horizontally with a speed V at the steel block. The steel ball then rebounds back along its original part with a speed of V over 2. So right now, the difference here between the second scenario and the first scenario is for the second scenario, the bullet or the ball will come towards the steel ball hit each other then rebound so it's not collide then move together it is hit then rebound so a steel ball will now move backwards at v over 2 and the steel block will move forward at v2 okay which statements about the blocks immediately after the collision is correct okay both blocks must travel at the same speed probably wrong so B, the steel block must travel faster than the wooden block. C, the wooden block must travel faster than the steel block. If B is correct, C is wrong. If C is correct, D is wrong. B is wrong. Okay. So the masses of the block and the steel ball are needed to determine which block travels faster. Okay. Actually, I don't think I need I need the masses. And let me explain why. This ball have a momentum mv before impact okay and then after that the change in momentum is m i say this is v1 but i can see from here the fact is the bullet or the wooden the steel ball when it hits the wooden block it has a decrease in momentum all right so probably the bullet will slow down momentum is conserved for Right. So the first idea here is momentum is conserved. So if momentum is conserved, the change in momentum of the ball, do they call it the ball? Okay, la, they call it the ball. Change of momentum of ball is equal to change of momentum of the block. Conserve what? I know you like to memorize the equation. M1, U1 is M1, blah, blah. M1, U1, M2, U2. You can write that. It's not a problem. But I can also think about the fact that if, let's say, 
the momentum of wood plus one, then the momentum of ball will minus one because momentum have to conserve. If one goes up by one, the other one will go down by one. So change the momentum of ball is equal to change the momentum of wood, wooden block, whatever. Lah. But in the opposite direction. I don't really care about the opposite direction though. So I'm going to write the word the magnitude. Because right now, there's no statement here about direction. It's not a paper two question. I don't want to overload my brain with too many things. Okay. Number two, I can say that for the wooden block, the ball has a smaller change in momentum. But teacher, how do you know that? Well, the main reason is the ball didn't change direction. This is the fastest way to know the to compare the relative magnitudes of the change in momentum. So because of this, I can say that the wooden block also has a smaller change in momentum. Why? Because the change in momentum of the block is equal to the change in momentum of the ball. So if the wooden block has a smaller change in momentum, this means that the wooden block is slower. Because in both cases, the initial momentum for the wooden block and the steel block is zero. So if the wooden block is slower, this means that the steel block must travel faster than the wooden block. I don't need to know the mass. I can write an equation. It will look quite long, but it's not really necessary. So let me see if I can find the place where I write equation for people. If I can find it, I'll show you lah. If I cannot, then never mind lah. Ah, yes. Okay. I'll flash it in front of you. So if I want to apply the conservation of momentum, I can. All right. The initial momentum is the MV of the, the ball plus the wooden block, which is not moving, and is equal to this one. And then I rearrange, I get V1. I repeat the same thing for the steel block. So you can check the equation is the same. It's just that now this uh, changed direction already. So if it changed direction, instead of mv over 2, it's negative mv over 2 plus mv2. All I want is to compare v1 and v2, right? So I'm going to do a bit of rearranging. So this negative mv2 bring over becomes positive mv over 2. So 1 plus 1 over 2 is 1.5, no? So 1.5 mv is big M v2. I just bring over and divide. So I compare these two. It's pretty obvious that 1.5 mv over m is more than 1 mv over m plus m. Because m plus m is already a bigger denominator. So you divide by a bigger number and your numerator is already smaller. So it's pretty obvious that v2 is bigger than v1. So if you want to do the math scan, but again, what we, what did we say at the beginning of today's live stream? One minute, right? So I'll only do this if I already finished the whole paper and I got nothing to do in my life and I kind of like, hmm, maybe they tricked me. Ah, then I come back and try. Lah. If not, right, my logic here is just the starting momentum is zero. This bullet has more change in momentum. It experienced more force because it's like literally reverse direction. So surely the steel will move faster. Then I choose B law. Then I move on with my life law, which you should do so. Here's the explanation typed up. Screenshot if you must. Okay. So the whole idea is you could either do everything or you could just do the logic in your brain 
then choose the right answer. Ready your brain. Okay, what's next? Winter 2022, P12, question 5. Average velocity. Thank you for answering your friends in the chat, by the way. Miss Ellie and I are very, very happy when we see students helping each other. That is the best thank you that you can give us when you go and help someone else. Share the love, share the physics. Also because it's a difficult subject, so got to help each other, you know. Don't struggle alone. Okay. A toy car travels on a circular track. Okay, this one looks like I need to draw. Toy car travels on a circular track. Let me draw a circle. With a constant speed of 0 0.5 meter per second, it passes a point on the track at t equal to 0 and takes 40 seconds to travel once around the track. Okay, I'm going to draw my starting line. 3, 2, 1, go. Okay, so maybe I start here. Okay, start. Okay, and then the, the, the car, the toy car is going to travel like that. Okay, so by the time the toy car travels, around the track to end up here the time is 40 seconds okay don't so by the time it reaches here t is equal to 40 seconds okay that was what is told by the question it takes 40 seconds to travel once around the track the magnitude of average velocity between 0 and 20 seconds is v20 between 0 and 40 seconds is v40. So whenever you think about average velocity, right? Velocity is a vector. So average velocity is average displacement or total displacement. Because technically speaking, if I want to find average, like my average marks, I take my total marks divided by number of subjects, right? So this one is total displacement over total time. So the easiest one to do is v40. Because V40, you return to a starting point, your displacement is zero. So zero, bye-bye. Okay. Where is T20? Well, T20 is here. So now I sort of like need to find the, the circumference of the circle. Teacher can find the circumference, man. Can, there? Okay, okay, so... V20 would be displacement or total displacement over total time. So the displacement from the start to the end at T is equal to 20 seconds is actually from here to here. I need to find this diameter of the circle. But teacher, how do I find the diameter of the circle? I can find the circumference because this circumference is the total part length. In other words, it is the distance traveled. Oh, if this is the distance traveled, the distance traveled here is the circumference. So let's say I call it D. But if I put it D, you think it's diameter. Okay, la. total part length. Let's say I call this L. The circle circumference is L. Circum of circle. If I can find L, I can find the diameter. If I can find the diameter, I can find the displacement. So this diameter is the displacement. Because how do we define displacement? The closest distance between where you start and where you end. Okay, so to find the total part length, I, can, I know for the fact that the car is traveling at a velocity of 0. Point, or the constant speed of 0. 0.50 meter per second. So I can use distance as speed multiplied by time. 
So it's 0 0.50 meter per second multiplied by 20 seconds. So this would be 10 meter. So if the circumference is 10 meter, then how can I find the diameter? Circumference will be pi d. Pi d is 10 meter. So if I want to find the diameter, the diameter is 10 over pi. I can press my calculator or I can just put it inside here. Okay, so V20 will be 10 over pi divided by 20. Okay. 10 divided by pi divided by 20. So 0 0.159. 0 0.10 divided by pi. Wait, uh, did I did I mess up something? 0 0.50 meter per second. 20 seconds to travel along the track. 20 seconds to travel along the track. 20 seconds is halfway. Passes a point. Track. 20 seconds. 0 0.5 times 20. Is ten. I R T diameter. Twenty seconds should be halfway, right? So did I math wrong? Divide by pi. Three point one eight divide by twenty. So one five nine. Hmm. Where did I make a mistake? Zero point five to pass a point. Try three equal to twenty. Let me check my calculations. I don't know this place, but. Turn one round. Then the average displacement to calculate the to calculate the diameter wrongly. Hang on. Long time since I did much physics. It's pie. Half pi d. Oh, because it's not the whole diameter, it's half. Ah, see, maths is rusty. Half. So this distance is not the circumference. It is half the circumference. That's right. See, you get a physics teacher to do maths. Maths is rusty. You probably have better maths than me. So this is 20 pi. Yes, very good. Thank you, chat. So what would this one be? The answer would be 1 over pi. So 0 0.318 or 0 0.32. Okay, the answer is A. See, can do the can do the difficult one, cannot do the easy things. Very normal. Also, currently Miss Ellie and I are taking a short break, so I'm doing the live stream during our semester break. I haven't touched physics for a week. <laughs> physics is rusty. That's why you should practice, especially when you are close to the exam. Okay, thank you for the help, chat. So the circumference is fine. I just forgotten that uh, this one is not the whole circumference. It is half of a circle. So basically draw the draw the question. Draw. Draw and try to do it. Is physics difficult? Yes. When you sign up for this subject, you weren't under the impression that it will be very easy, right? <laughs> so 
learning to live through and sit with the uncomfortable difficulty and also forgive yourself when you make some mistakes just make sure and then try to figure out ways to make sure it doesn't happen again it's part of learning physics you just saw miss lee do it although she's been teaching physics for 15 years it's a bit like kung fu or martial arts relatively competent but still will have errors especially if you didn't practice enough or maybe somehow you just didn't see certain things no? it's just one objective question but if every objective question cannot do that one a bit difficult lah. right so practice a bit okay and learn to sit with that difficulty that's how you get better if today cannot think about it never mind you can try again tomorrow now a levels cannot think about it to be honest a lot of stuff i didn't understand in my a levels either it's a lifelong continuous learning process. By a nutshell, if you want to find average velocity, please take the displacement divided by the time. The displacement at 40 seconds is very straightforward, is for is zero. The displacement at halfway is the diameter. Okay? Alright. May, June 2, 1, P, 1, 2. I'm not answering any particular paper. I'm just answering the questions people are asking me. Do you have a question? Don't ask in the chat in the stream. Ask in the community post. Go to the community tab. And ask in the community post. Okay, I'm going to assume that I understand your paper code because it's not how I code my papers. But yeah. This is from Nawit Ahmed. Okay, then maybe I'll do one or two questions about electricity, one or two questions about circuit, and one or two questions about polarization. Then we got nothing else to ask. Community posts are. Huh? I'm. I can't really read the chat because it requires me to click into a different space. And the chat is for you to chat with each other. So your question will get bumped away. Please don't spam the chat, okay? Okay, we have about half an hour left. So let's look at this question. P12 question 13. I feel like we have recorded this question. Let me check. Ah, yes, we have. So I am going to copy this link and reply to you in the community post. It's some talk question. Okay, so check recording. You want to search a particular question from the channel? This is what you do. Just go to YouTube. The channel, thanks to your subscription, is uh, popular enough to pop up already. Key in subject code. The way I, the way we code the papers is the sitting, the year, the sitting, the year, the paper number, the question. Then you can see Miss Ellie's beautiful face here. Or I guess you can see this person or whichever lah. Doesn't matter. As long as you learn, we are happy. It does really doesn't matter to us. Physics is physics. Okay? So if you want to help for any particular objective question, you can just search using the paper code. Okay, so um let's see. Maybe I will do D questions about circuits and superposition from the Fab March paper. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do some circuits. I'll do the difficult ones. Do you want me to do the easy ones? Okay, well, I'll do... If I just do the difficult ones, then you're gonna think, paper one is very difficult, but no one is asking the easy questions for obvious reasons, right? So, maybe... Maybe I'll do this. I'll discuss the Fat March 2 3 paper so we don't get too paranoid, okay? 
and then I'll do the circuits and superposition questions. Loading. Okay, there you go. So the so-called not so fair part is I have done one of the superposition question because it was asked in the community post. But we could work on can okay, I will do circuits first. Okay, uh, FATMASH 2.3, we're going to work on the circuit questions and we're going to start with question 30. It says here that the wire carries a current of 0 0.10 microampere, this is I. Potential difference across the wire is V. How much energy is dissipated in 10 seconds? I have I, I have V, I have S. I guess I can use the equation power is equal to VI or IV, but then to find energy from power, I can take energy over time is equal to VI, right? Because I want to find energy. So energy is VIT, no? vitamin C. Anyway, 10 milli, negative 3, uh, 0 0.10 micro. This one is basically, tell me you are ch testing whether students can do prefix without telling me that you are testing whether students can do prefix. Time is 10 seconds. Okay, I'm going to do a gathering of prefix, okay? So right now I have a negative 3 here. I have a negative 6 here. So negative 3 and negative 6 is negative 9. Okay, then 10 times 0 0.1 is 1. 1 times 10 is 10, so I'll put back 10 here. So it's 10 times 10 to the power of negative 9. But negative 9, is it nano? Is it pico? Well, micro, nano, pico. Micro is negative 6, nano is negative 9, pico is negative 12. So this is 10 nano joule. D. Okay, this is a question that is actually testing your prefix on top of testing whether you understand circuits. Okay, next, question 31. In this question, you are asked the definition of potential difference across electrical component. So whenever you see potential difference, right, V is always energy transferred per unit charge. This one is a memory question, meaning you're supposed to memorize the definition. Okay, so the extra thing I can give you is, when we talk about potential difference, it is, electrical energy to non-electrical energy per unit charge. This is the more detailed definition or you could just say energy transferred per unit charge if you're talking about a shorter version. Okay, EMF will be in the opposite direction, non-electrical to electrical. Okay, right, circuits not difficult, carrying on. Let's look at this question. Which graph represents the way current through a filament lamp varies through a potential difference across it? If I know the share of the graph, I know the answer is B. Okay. In fact, I can even label the different types. But generally speaking, filament lamp gets hot. I have experience of touching a hot light bulb. So when I touch a hot light bulb and it gets hot, filament lamp gets hot. So I know when it's hot, V increase or I increase then the resistance will increase. If the resistance will increase, this means that the ratio of V over I will be bigger here compared to, let's say, here. Okay, so the answer is B. This one is an ohmic conductor because it obeys Ohm's law. Normally at constant temperature, this is a diode. This is a thermistor. Will it save you time if you memorize them? Sure, but if you can't memorize and you know the properties, you can deduce it. All right, so far so good. Let's look at 33. 
The table shows the property of two different wires, P and Q. Wow, so nice, huh? they give you table. Sometimes they give you in a paragraph, which is kind of annoying. And it says here that the wire P has a cross-section of diameter D. What's the diameter of wire Q? Okay. So basically, if I have another column for diameter, if this is D, what is the diameter of Q in terms of D? Okay, step one, write equation. R is equal to rho L over A. Step two, use the equation for wire P and wire Q. So, wire P. R is equal to rho L over A. I'm going to call this AP because I don't know what's the area of P. Okay, and then repeat the equation for wire Q. Wire Q is R over 4, 1 over 4 R is equal to 1 over 3 rho 2 L over AQ. Now I see a lot of things that I don't want to exist anymore. All the rho, the L, the R, I want to be able to cancel them off because I need to put in the value of D inside area soon. Okay? But the easiest way to get rid of the equation is not really by substitution, it's by multiplying them. But if let's say, for example, if you multiply or divide them and your brain just cannot for whatever reason, then what I would suggest is obviously there is uh, the most easiest way to find the common subject of the equation. So I'll put 4 here. Okay, so this will be 4 over 3 rho, bringing up the 4, or multiply both sides by 4, which is a more accurate way of saying it, over a q. So now I got equation 1, equation 2. And I can equate equation 1 to equation 2. They look the same, right? So rho l over a p is equal to 4 over 3 rho, 2L over AQ. I'm doing this rather than my usual method because I realize some people tend to struggle with it, which is okay. Here's an alternative that you may want to try out. But hey, look at me. I like cancelling stuff. Please don't cancel the area. The area are not the same. At least we don't know yet. Okay, so I'm just going to pull this here. AQ over AP is equal to 4 times 2 is 8. 8 over 3. Hopefully my maths is correct. All right, anyway, area is pi d over 2 square. But instead of pi d over 2 square, I can put pi d square over 4, right? Pi dq square over 4 divided by pi dp square over 4. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just pi by. So this will be 8 over 3. I want to find the diameter of dq in terms of the diameter of dp, which is given d. There. dp is d, what is dq? So, if dp is d, what is dq? I'm going to bring over here and square root 8 over 3. Okay, so dq will be equal to square root of 8 over 3, which is... 1.63 d which will make your answer b okay so this kind of thing if i'm running out of time i can skip one because i know i will need to do some ratio and i know i know i need to do some cancelling if i'm i can do this faster more efficiently then that's great um, but it's generally quite doable. Okay, so allocate maybe a few minutes for this kind of question, but don't shy away from them. Okay, next one. A cell has a constant EMF. A variable resistor is connected between the terminals of the cell. The resistance of the variable resistor is decreased. Which statement about the change of the cell's terminal potential difference is correct? I'm going to draw the circuit. 
As I draw the circuit, I will talk to you a little bit about statement questions. In your objective paper, you will encounter, but I'm not sure which subtopic, lah, a statement question like this, meaning they are trying to test your ability to conceptualize stuff. Some will discuss tonight as well, lah, right? And when you see a statement question, you got to ready your brain, right? You got to like, I know my physics, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be fooled by your questions. So you got to think that way, though. Anyway, this is a variable resistor. I actually don't really know if there's an internal resistance. Right, the question just say a variable resistor is connected across a terminal. So this is my variable resistor, VR. And then they're asking you to talk about the cell's terminal potential difference. Okay, a terminal potential. Look, I can draw it in many different places. This is a terminal potential. This is a terminal potential. You want to be an agent of chaos, this is a terminal potential. They will all have the same readings. Because what is, there is nothing, there is nothing here to decrease the potential. Nothing here to do work done per unit charge. Nothing here to do any work done per unit charge, assuming the connecting wires have zero resistance. Meaning, whatever these three voltmeter are measuring is all the same thing. Okay? So we want to know what would change the cell terminal potential difference. Okay? Which is what the question is asking. So generally speaking, my suggestion is ready your brain. Don't be fooled. Okay? So hopefully you're ready. So it says here that we decrease VR. If I decrease VR, the amount of uh, potential difference across VR decreases because there is less resistance. So there is basically when VR decrease, the voltmeter reading should decrease. Okay, if it makes you happier, I guess you can write an equation. EMF internal resistance, E is equal to VR external resistor plus VR internal resistance. Kirchhoff's second law, conservation of energy, energy supplied by the battery is equal to energy use outside plus energy use inside. Okay, so right now, if I decrease my VR, because also at the same time, the shadow equation for this is IR plus IR. But this is the variable resistor. So when this one decrease, what happens to VR? Also decrease. So the terminal potential difference is increased, is already immediately out. Okay. But option B very sus. Eh? Did the current decrease? No. If anything, because the resistance decreased, the current should increase. If you want to, I will rewrite this equation, I, R plus R. If you want to, the I is here. This is my I. This is the I. So it looks like if RV decrease and the EMF of the cell will not change, I should increase. So the answer is A, long. But here, it says here that more work is done moving a unit charge through the internal resistance of the cell. Not less work done, meh. Yes, through the external resistance, yes. Through the internal resistance, no. More work is done moving a unit charge through the internal resistance of the cell, bracket, due to the current increase. Okay? And because of this, less work is done in the variable external resistor. At the end of the day, energy is conserved. If my outside resistor doesn't need that much potential difference, the inside resistor will take the rest because the current increases. Okay? So this kind of statement, you can use equation, you can use logic, you may need a combination of both to figure out what is the most suitable answer. Okay, moving on. 
Kirchhoff's two law for circuits can be derived using conservation. Oh, I just mentioned this. Which conservation of law does Kirchhoff law depends on? So first law is about current. So current is about charge, not current. Conservation of charge. Because current is charge per unit time. Okay, so how much charge passes through a junction. And then Kirchhoff's second law is about conservation of energy. So the answer is B. Yeah. Okay, basic stuff. Okay, moving on. So somewhere around question 36 is where the circuit question get a bit spicy, meaning you get some strange connection, maybe, I don't know, one or two. La. At most, you get two to three difficult circuit questions, which I think is okay, it's not that bad. All right. Anyway, here you have the circuit nicely drawn for you, and you're asked to find the internal resistance R and the external resistor capital R. So my hack here as a student who wants to do question very fast is I count uh, 10, I just immediately see 10, 10, 2 is 2, 15 is 15, just do very do a very quick check. Just want to make sure that the values are all labeled in the diagram. If they label in the diagram, I'm happy, I don't need to read already. Okay, so right now they're asking you to find the value of R, inside R and outside R. Okay, no problem. First step, I use the branch because the current flow like that, right? This is one branch, then this is the other branch. Immediately, my brain visualized the current flow. Okay, so it's a very straightforward split at this junction. I can tell the yellow junction, the yellow branch, I got all the values. I got the I, I got the R, I can find V. So this V would be equal to IR, which is 0 0.48 times 15. So merely my calculator comes, 0 0.48 times 15, this is 7.2 volt. If this is 7.2 volt, because it's parallel, here to here will also be 7.2 volt. Okay, but there are two resistors here to share 7.2 volt. So now if I take 0 0.45 times 2, I will get 0 0.9. Right, let me check. Uh, 15, 7.2, okay, 0 0.45 times 2 is 0 0.9. So the potential difference from here to here is 0 0.9 volt. Again, this 0 0.9 volt is I times R. So, do we know the potential difference from here to here? I will take 7.2 volt minus 0 0.9, which is 6.3. So this is 6.3 volt, this is 0 0.9 volt, so that together they make 7.2 volt. But do I know the current that flows through the R? Yes, I do. This current is 0 0.45. So V equal to IR again, but the V is 6.3 and the current is 0 0.45 R. So I can find R. 6.3 divided by 0 0.45. So this will be 14 ohm. Okay. All right, one last thing. I need to find the internal resistance. You could worry your brain, but I don't want to because the external circuit takes 7.2, right? So what is the internal circuit going to take? This one will be 7.2 minus or 10 minus 7.2. Outside already takes 7.2. So what is left for the internal resistance will be 10 minus 7.2. Okay, so this would be 2.8 volt. So now I know the current flowing through this R, right? 2 point V is equal to IR. So 2.8 is equal to the current. This current is after the two current merge together. So I have 0 0.45 plus 0 0.48. Look at my highlight, the current already merged together. 0 0.48 plus 0 0.45 ampere. Okay, and the internal resistor is R. So now I can find R. There are other ways to do it, but this is the fastest one now, because I don't have to find things that I don't want to find. Okay, the answer is A. 
So it's doable if you are fairly adaptable. And basically, I haven't used any other equation but V equal to IR. Even this equation is V is equal to IR in a different form. Okay. So what I'm doing is basically I'm saying for, let's say you look at the yellow color loop. Sum of the EMF is 10 is equal to the sum of the external resistance 7.2 plus 2.8 for the yellow loop. 10 is equal to 7.2 plus 2.8 for the blue loop. Okay, so that's it for question 36. Let's look at 37. So this question is a variable resistor. No, it's a thermistor here, which changes with temperature. You can see they give you so nice. When it's 20 degrees Celsius, it's 12 kilo ohm. So when temperature increase, the resistance drop. This is the characteristic of the thermistor. So the potential difference V out across the fixed resistor is 4.50 volt when the thermistor is at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, I'm going to write that down. Twenty degrees Celsius. This is four point five volt. I know this twenty degrees Celsius. This is twelve kilo ohm. Okay. This is the thermistor. Is this one? Uh, this is the thermistor. So the external resistor or the fixed resistor and the thermistor have the same resistance at 20 degrees Celsius. So that means if this is 4.5 volt, let me change color. If this is 4.5 volt, this should also be 4.5 volt because they have the same resistance. So they will have the same potential difference. Okay. So think about the current flowing through here is the same current they have the same resistance and so they will have the same potential difference. Same current, same resistance, same potential difference. Same I, same R, same V. All good. Okay, a bit boring. Moving on. What is the V out when we change the temperature to 50 degrees Celsius? Okay, let me draw a quick one here. So my thermistor is now here. And this new resistance is not 12 kilo ohm, it's 5 kilo ohm. Okay. Followed by this resistor here, which still is kept at 12 kilo ohm. But my V out is connected here. This is my V out. So I think I should at least say this once per live stream, right? Ratio is your best friend. Okay, so right now I know that um, the total potential from here to here is 9 volt. And I didn't change the battery, meaning here to here connected to the same battery. See, yeah, this part I lazy to draw, but it's connected to the same battery, okay? So that means here to here is also 9 volt. They are sharing 9 volt. Previously, their resistance is the same, so they share the 9 volt in half. Currently, the resistance is not the same. So I want to find V out. Okay, so I'm going to use V out over 12 kilo ohm ratio is equal to the total one, 9 volt, over the total resistance, 12 plus 5 kilo ohm. Okay, so from here, I can find my V out. Just this ratio, this is the same as this ratio, this. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so I take the potential difference, ratio the corresponding resistance, then I take the whole thing, ratio the whole thing. Okay, that's the easiest way I can think of to do this. So this would be 9 over 17, because the kilo ohm and kilo ohm will cancel out. Ma. My favorite thing to do, cancel common terms in maths. So this would be 9 times 12 divided by 17, and it would be 6.35. So I generally find circuits not very intimidating, they are doable, but even if you find it difficult, maybe that's okay, you are still learning. 
there are only two to three difficult circuit questions. Speaking of, of which, I think I saw a few here. So I think I'll end tonight by doing the strange looking bridge ones that people tend to ask me. So in the earlier in the live stream, I did a few wave questions. So I think I'll do this one. I'll do that polarization question and then we'll call it. Okay. So here, whenever I see a circuit like this, I'm really you got a headache already, right? Because you're like, what the heck? Why are they four resistors? You know, like when you see a circuit like this, you go like, what the heck? Why are they four resistors? Why? Okay, never mind. Don't worry. We know all the resistors. They have names one. The arrow is variable resistor. Whenever you see an arrow in the circuit, it means you can change. The vanilla box, uh, nothing, uh, just the box only, is a regular fixed resistor. Uh, nothing else. No, no, no spiciness, no random arrow, no random line. Uh, this is fixed. Then this one, when the light pointing here, leh, this is what we like to call LDR, not long distance relationship, uh, is light dependent resistor. So the way this one works is when it's bright, the electrons get more excited, resistance will drop. When it's dark, the electron get very sleepy. You know sleepy man? It's 11 p.m. in Malaysia now. Ah, then very sleepy. Your brain cannot resistance physics. Your brain resists physics. Ah, resistance increase. Okay, so this resistors, this resistors, resistance is dependent on the light intensity. When it's bright, the resistance is low. When it's dark, the resistance is high. Okay, next. You see this spoon? It looks like a spoon. At least it looks like a spoon to me. Like, you know the chemistry spoon you used to scoop the you scoop the, the powder one? Ah, it looks like a spoon to me. This is the mister. Okay, this looks like a spoon. <laughs> Okay, like if not, then you just accept that this is the symbol of thermistor. So for this thermistor, it, we did a question just now already, but the whole point here is this thermistor, when it's hot, when it's hot, the resistance will drop. When it's cold, the resistance will go up. Okay. What else do we need to know? We have a voltmeter, it's connected like that. Initially, the resistance of each four component is one kilo ohm. Wow. Okay, so you are one kilo ohm, you are one kilo ohm, you are one kilo ohm, you are one kilo ohm. In this setting, the voltmeter reading will be zero because everything is perfectly balanced. If it's one, 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 then you look at this positive terminal of the battery. This is 6.0 volt. This is 6.0 volt. Okay. Then this what this variable resistor will minus 3 volt. Fixed resistor minus 3 volt. Okay, you got no more volts. Time to go back to battery to recharge. Okay. LDR minus 3 volt, thermistor minus 3 volt. Okay, you got no more battery, go home to recharge. Get the idea? But right now, you want the voltmeter to show a positive reading. So if you want the voltmeter to show a positive reading, currently this voltmeter is 3 volt. This side here is also 3 volt. Because 6 minus 3 is 3, 6 minus 3 is 3. 3 and 3 got no difference. That's why the voltmeter reading is 0. 3 volt, 3 volt, 0. Potential difference, ma. there's no difference. Okay, so if I want to have a positive reading, I need Vx to be bigger than V1. That's how I'll get a positive reading. I need the potential here to be higher than the potential at 1. The positive should win. Ah, then I get a positive reading. So here are my options. Number one, decrease the temperature of the thermistor. Okay, I am going to crop the circuit and go through it one by one, but presumably when a student is doing this, they don't need to explain to anyone their reasoning, lah, so it shouldn't take as long as I will take now. So the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to decrease the temperature of the thermistor. So if this T decrease is colder, right? R increase. 
So if R increased, previously it was minus 3 volt, right? Now it could be like, let's say minus 4. Then here would be minus 6, minus 6 plus. Then here would be minus 2. So that when you start with 6, you can end with 0. 6 minus 2 will make VY4. Remember this one was 3 just now? You cannot, law. VY is bigger than VX. So, A is out. Okay. B. Increase the resistance of the variable resistor. Okay. So, if I want this resistance increase, then here would minus, will have a greater potential drop. It's R here increase, ma. So, maybe now this is minus 4. So, you know how we started with 6 here? 6 minus 4, I, uh, this one become 2. But the other side, I didn't change anything. So, it's still 6 and 3. GG. Vx is still less than Vy. Not what we want. We don't want Vx, can I rewrite this? We don't want Vx to be less than Vy. So in this case, right, if I want to write down an explanation for A, temperature of thermistor decrease, resistance of thermistor increase. So that's not what we want. Because when resistance of thermistor decrease, increase, sorry, Vy will increase. So no. For B, when I increase the resistance of variable resistor, Vx decrease, which is not what we want. Okay, C. Reduce the intensity of the light incident on the light, the LDR. Okay, you want to make this LDR light intensity decrease. So basically, it's darker. Lah. Okay, so when it's dark, the resistance will increase. Like very sleepy already, ma. the brain also resistant to new knowledge. Meaning here, the drop in potential is higher. Maybe instead of minus 3, now it's minus 4. Then here is minus 2. So remember how we started with 6 here? 6 minus 4, this is 2. Promising. Because Vx I didn't change, this is maintained at 3. So now I have Vx greater than Vy. My answer is C. Okay, because this one, I can say this causes the resistance of LDR to, to rise, causing the Vy to drop. This is what we want. Okay, and finally, replace the fixed resistor with a 500 ohm resistor. I... So this means resistance decrease, right? Because initially it's 1 kilo ohm. Okay, so for option D, I'm going to change this one from 1 kilo ohm to 500 ohm. Okay, meaning the drop here would be less, maybe this is negative 2 volt, so here would be negative 4 volt. So 6 minus 4 is 2. If 6 minus 4 is 2 and this is 3, Vx is still less than Vy. Because when the bottom resistor decreases, it will take less potential. When it takes less potential, the other one will have to take more. Teacher, how you know the, uh, the, the values is 3? I know the value is 3 here because the resistance are all the same. That's how I know it's 3 because it splits into half. Okay? There is say here, ma, initial resistance of each four component is 1. So everybody is 1. We equally share the potential. 6 is shared, 3 and 3. So the midpoint will be 3. How do I know after all these changes that it is 2 and 4? I don't know. I just know it decreased only. But it doesn't matter because I just need to know whether it increased or decreased because all I care about is positive reading and to get a positive reading, my potential difference at X must be greater than Y. So this kind of question need time for you to actually solve or to digest one. So give yourself that time. Of course, you can just don't care because it's an objective question, but it's also a good place if let's say you've been putting in effort in circuit to show that you can answer the question well. It's the only time you can show that you answer the question well. Okay? So, 
These are critical engineering skills. We are confident that you can develop them. The important thing is to not develop them the eve before the exam. Very stressed already, right? So do what you can. Okay. And think, did the bridge. So I think one last thing I'll do is the polarization question. Okay, la, this one. Okay. So here's a polarization question. And it would be the final question for tonight. And then I'll maybe look at chat for a few minutes. So this polarization question, we have a beam of vertically polarized light. So this is the beam that is coming. They are vertically polarized, meaning, you know, the light is oscillating up and down, vertical. The filter can be rotated so that it is always in a plane perpendicular to the beam. The transmission axis is initially vertical. So I'm going to draw the initial situation. So initial situation, and I sometimes will draw this in 2D so that you can understand what is going on. This is the transmission axis, which I will draw in dotted line. Okay, so this is the initial position, initially vertical. The light was also initially vertical. Maybe I changed the color of the light. Ah, the light is also initially vertical. So let's say the light that enters in here is I or I naught. Then the light that come out here is IT transmitted. So this is the initial one. The initial one theta is zero. I can say the transmitted is equal to the incident. Okay. Now we are going to start rotating. The filter is first rotated clockwise by 30 degrees so that the transmitted light wave have an intensity I30. Okay, so I am going to now rotate my filter a bit. Let's say somewhat in this direction, doesn't really matter. I want to rotate it by 30 degrees. So this was the original position. This is the, it's going to continue. Okay, this is the vertical line. I rotate this by 30 degree, meaning now my transmission axis is here, where this is 30 degree. But where is your vertical, the original light? The original light is here. So right now, your transmitted is equal to I naught cos square 30 degree. Okay, because the 30 degree is the angle between the wave and the transmission axis. They asked me to call this I30. Okay, well, I30 is I not cos square 30, right, is root 3 over 2. So 3 over 4. Or press calculator. Okay, continue. Filter is then rotated clockwise by another 30 degree. Okay, okay. Rotate another 30 degree. Okay, I don't even know what rectangle I'm drawing right now. But again, I don't really care about the rectangle. I care about the axis. Because this is where my light is. This is the orientation of my light. Okay, no, hang on. It looks a bit ridiculous. Something like this. Like this. I rotate some more. Okay. But where's the transmission axis? The transmission axis is further angle 30 degree. That means from this angle, I rotate another 30 degree. Leh. So now I am here. And what is my new angle? 60. But where is my old, where is my wave? I didn't change my wave or my wave is still here. I rotate another 30, uh, so 30 plus 30 is 60, but I didn't change the wave, so the wave is still at the same place, which means my now I transmitted is I not, because don't forget, uh, this 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 wave is I not, okay? This one is your I not, your incident wave, it's still the same wave. This one is I not. If you want to write Mellor's law in its entirety for this one, this is cos square 0, because the theta is 0, and cos 0 is 1. 1 square is 1. So IT equal I naught. Okay? But right now this transmitted axis is equal to I naught cos square 60. Because this is the angle. So don't forget uh, this angle, I want to emphasize this many times. Okay. This angle is the angle between the wave 
and the transmission axis. So you must always be very clear where the wave is vertically polarized or where is the wave oscillating. Okay, so hopefully that, that's, you will remember that. Anyway, the transmitted for this is basically, I call it I60. La. I want to find I60. Okay, so I60 is I0, cos square 60 is 1 over 4. So looking at the answer, this tells me I want I60 in terms of I30. Uh, for the don't know how many times in your physics life, you are now with two equations and you need to eliminate which one I0. I prefer to divide them. If you cannot divide, you can substitute I0 and do your best. But I like dividing because I can cancel the stuff that I don't like, see. So this is 3 over 4. This is I0, 1 over 4. What do I not like? What do I not want? I0. I0 is not here. In fact, the 4 also can cancel, right? So in then after that, I bring the 3 over. So 1 over 3 I30 is I60. And 1 over 3 0 0.33 I30 is I60. Nah, B. Okay, so what do we learn in this question? The important thing, the very important thing is when you apply the law of Mellus or Mellus law, which is new in your syllabus, you always have to take the angle between the wave and the transmission axis. The wave I draw in light blue. The transmission axis for the first rotation is 30 degree. You rotate another further degree is 60. Write down the Mellus law equation first. Then only see what you can do. Okay, don't jump step. Especially if you haven't done enough questions, don't jump step. It's okay to do step by step. There, I don't, I don't think that the shortcut is viable unless you know the shortcut and you can't make mistakes. All right. So this is the polarization question. And if you need some superposition questions, they're all already recorded. Please use the playlist. We, Miss Ellie and I, slowly build a library for a reason. Because one person, one session will not be able to cover the entire breadth of your syllabus. You hear that? You, one person, one night cannot do all what. Just do what you can. And get enough rest before tomorrow. Okay? So I think in a few more days, you will finish. Finish. AS. Look at you. Go. Okay? And when you finish already, take a good break. You know, this weekend. Go do something nice for yourself. Spend some time with the people that love you. That you love. Okay? play some games, go outside, touch some grass, hug a friend, you did it. Once you get enough rest, you rest a few days, then you come back for your A2. If you decide to do more physics, okay? ET Physics channel will always be there for you on YouTube, hopefully. And I will see you in the next live stream. In the meantime, if you feel that you need regular help with your revision for your A2, there are revision classes that I run uh, that you can sign up for if you think it is helpful. Okay, so this is just a little added boost for the students who want it. But generally speaking, if you are mainly learning your physics on your own independently, you are pretty awesome and pretty cool. So you can continue on your own, use the Discord forum. The class is just an add-on if you think it's needed. You can find more information in the links or wherever you are in touch. Okay, take care. Do your best, and when you are done, tell yourself, I have done my best. Maybe next time I will do things differently, but it's okay. I've done my best. I deserve some rest. I deserve to go and do something that I like. I will come back again, and I'll continue with my life. Okay? Don't be too harsh on yourself. If you want to sign up for classes, um, you can go to the channel QR code scan the QR code okay so all the information is here if you want further information there is more information on the Google form that is linked all right only if you find it if you need if you find that you need to see me two to three times a week we'll do a quick flash revision through the syllabus and you do some questions on your own okay so for more information how the class is like what the class includes yada yada scan the QR code, go find the link, okay? So slightly self-promotion, but you awesome people, hang in there, you'll be fine. Take care. Thanks for helping each other, by the way.
it I it really brightens Miss Ellie and my day when we see students helping each other in the forums or learning or sharing resources with each other. Okay, that's all. Take care. Don't sleep too late. And I will see you whenever, wherever. Say hi. Don't be a stranger. Bye-bye. Take care and all the best, everybody. Good night. Thanks for showing up today. You are pretty awesome.